Good morning. So, I sent you an email uh, on Saturday. So tomorrow I lecture you, and uh, you should please bring your PC tomorrow. And uh, I confirm that I'm not lecturing next Monday. We make the ponte, okay? And the next Tuesday is uh, holiday, public holiday in Italy. It's level day. So we will see each other again on May 7th, tomorrow, and May 7th. Tomorrow I need to schedule the additional lectures that I mentioned to you. So please uh, try to get information on your schedule in the coming, in the month of May, so that we can uh, find out uh, three, I, I don't remember, I have to check how many, how many lectures we need to find out in order to be able to hopefully close this uh, subject at, at the end of May. And, uh, but I prefer to speak tomorrow about this. Another thing, uh, do, does somebody of you have any presentation to deliver about interactive activities, uh, etc.? If any, uh, my preference would be for tomorrow or later on. Okay, May 7. If you have any any requirement for tomorrow, if you let me know in advance, it would be great. And again, I encourage you to do that. So, any idea that you have uh, is fine. Don't be don't be afraid or concerned by uh, whatever doubt that uh, you may have. I think that so far it was interesting. The only thing it was just uh, not very frequent. So I hope that in May we may have the opportunity to intensify. I'll uh, try to uh, make some proposals to you. Okay, fine. So, today we have uh, this couple of hours uh, that I would like to dedicate first to saying uh, something more and something that is uh, extremely important for the application of models uh, in hydrology, water resources uh, management, uh, and uh, design of water resource systems in general. And the subject that, <coughs> the general subject that we are discussing uh, is, uh, as you may remember, estimation of water resources availability, and uh, in particular by using models, which we spoke about inductive methods, and then deductive methods, the deductive methods make use of models, as you may remember, and we talked about uh, uh, rainfall and off models and groundwater models. And I mentioned to you that uh, these models have parameters. Uh, so what are the parameters in a model? I think we already defined what a parameter is. It's uh, basically a coefficient into model equations. It's a coefficient that is uh, that assumes uh, typically a constant value once the model is defined. But uh, it uh, may be changed uh, in the phase uh, of model preparation. <coughs> Basically, during the phase of model preparation, in order to make the model able to be applied, in order to make the model applicable, we need, of course, to identify the model and uh, to check if the model works well, etc. And an essential part of this uh, is uh, the determination of the parameter values. And once they are determined, uh, they are kept constant. They are measurable quantities, usually. So they are numbers, numbers that need to be specified. We said that what is uh, the meaning, uh, not the meaning, the function of a parameter. What is the scope of a parameter? Parameters uh, are introduced in order to make the model flexible. Of course, if you have a coefficient in an equation that can be, can be tuned, can be changed before assuming its final value, you make the equation flexible. You may adapt, you have an opportunity to adapt the equation to the process that you want to describe. So the purpose of parameters, again, is to make the model flexible. And we saw example of parameters in several cases, like when we talked about the linear reservoir, we had only one parameter that we introduced in order to make the model flexible. And the parameter was the time constant of the linear reservoir itself. I think this is a nice example because I always forget to take the chalk, so I need to, to use something very I need to be very economical in using the chalk today. And uh, as I said, 
In the linear reservoir, we introduced this parameter, which uh, was defined as uh, uh, Qt is equal to Wt divided by K, and K is our parameter. And uh, we said that it has the dimension of a time. And uh, I think this is a nice example to explain what the meaning of a parameter. We may have simply said that uh, Q is related to W through a known relationship. So we could have placed here a number instead of a parameter. If had we done this, the model would be less flexible. By introducing this parameter that we can change, we can adapt the model to the process that we are describing. The model does not necessarily have parameters. There are models that are called non-parametric, which means that they are defined without parameters. Non-parametric. And of course, the disadvantage is that you cannot adapt your model to the specific process. What is the disadvantage instead of introducing a parameter? So I said, OK, if I don't introduce parameters, the disadvantage is that the model is less flexible. But there are also disadvantages in introducing parameters. And of course there are, because uh, having no disadvantages, people wouldn't conceive non-parametric models. So if there are people that try to develop models that don't include parameters, of course, there must be disadvantages in introducing parameters. And indeed, there is a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that we have to fix the value of this parameter. And uh, it's not easy. And this is what we discuss today. We discuss today model parametrization. There are many synonyms for describing this operation. The first is model parametrization. I start from this because, of course, the meaning is very easy to get. Parametrization or parametrization, it depends on English or American English. So you can call it parametrization without an E here, or you can introduce an E. Which means uh, assigning value, values to parameters. Synonyms are model optimization. And again, optimization, it's quite easy to understand why we use this word. <coughs> Optimization because I, I put here a Z between parentheses because you know in American English and uh, opti, sorry, optimization. In American <coughs> English, the S is substituted by a Z. And uh, optimization because we optimize the model by assigning values to the parameters, we get uh, optimal configuration of the model. Another synonym, which is widely used, by the way, it's model calibration. Calibration because we calibrate the parameters. And uh, this is the term that I use here, model calibration. OK. I just would like to anticipate that the larger the number, the larger the number of parameters, the more complex this operation is. Of course, because if we have to assign only one value, it's easier than assigning five values, like for the IMOD model. IMOD counts, as you may remember, five parameters. It's not easy. OK, so how can we do this? There are different uh, uh, avenues that we can follow to assign the parameter values. And uh, here I divide them in two categories. So we can use expert knowledge, or we can optimize model performances. Expert knowledge means that, based on my experience, 
I guess that the k value for a given watershed catchment is uh, 1000. This is expert knowledge, which is very helpful, of course, in engineering, because in engineering we know that we have to make a wise use, a wise integration of uh, theoretical knowledge and expert knowledge. Expert knowledge means that we know what is the best uh, option for a whatever question related to design, based on our experience. One thing that I would like to say, there is an abuse of the term expert knowledge sometimes uh, in uh, practical application. And uh, the abuse is, in my opinion, the fact that people tend to relate expert knowledge to long experience, long in time, which is not true. Expert knowledge means that one is expert. And, uh, the fact that a person is expert, it's not related to the length of his experience. So you as a student may be more expert than me, even if my experience is longer. Because if you study a lot and if you are very, very good in studying and to find, uh, to find recent sources, uh, to find innovative sources, uh, it's very easy for you to get more knowledge with respect to me. It's, uh, so. I think that expert knowledge is not necessarily related to the age of a person. So there are out uh, people that think that uh, in order to gain expert knowledge, your minimum age should be 50. That's not true. I mean, expert knowledge is related to your amount of knowledge. And uh, a person that is 30 just after the degree or even during the degree may have more expert knowledge and more experience, I say, with respect to a person that uh, been working for, for 40 years. Actually, this is frequently the case. Uh, even persons that are old in age, not all of them, but uh, you know, when uh, people become older and older, they tend to quit studying because uh, for obvious reasons. And th there are some people that keep studying up, the, up to the end of their working activity, but they are not frequent, uh, and this applies to everybody, medical doctors, uh, engineers, uh, lawyers, uh, and therefore, you know, it's not so, it's not so infrequent to find the people that are in their 30s or 40s that are more expert than people in their 60s or 70s, which, as I said, it's not a rule, but it happens. Okay, so let me go back to modern calibration. Expert knowledge is a possibility. And then there is uh, another possibility, as I said, it's let's optimize model performances. Let's start from this, because this is uh, the solution that is most widely applied. You will understand why. And optimizing model performances means that uh, we find the optimal value of the parameters that makes the model well performing with respect to observed data. So we need to observe data. This is uh, the first requirement for optimization of model performances. We need to observe data. We run the model, we compare the model with the data, and uh, identify the parameter values that uh, makes, makes the model best performing. This is quite, I mean, this is quite a straightforward. Like, uh, I want to use the linear reservoir to reproduce a catchment, and I have an observed hydrograph. Let's suppose that I have this observed hydrograph, QD, with respect to time. And here is my hydrograph. Of course, I may have several of them. Let's focus on just one example of one hydrograph. And then I apply the linear reservoir. I get Observe the data of precipitation. You remember that for running the linear reservoir, what you need is uh, basically to get precipitation data. By running the model, I just put a guess value for k, maybe based on my expert knowledge, but this is not very important, just a guess value. And uh, the observed hydrograph looks like this. And they say, ah, this is not very good. And then I try to rerun the model with another value of k. And then I may get another observer hydrograph, which is like this. 
and they say, ah, this is not very good. Which means that the k value must in be in between the two trial values that I attempted. And therefore, by refining my trials, I get to a simulation which uh, may be quite close to the observed one. And they may say, OK, this is fine. This is my best value for k. In doing that, what I did is a trial and error procedure, which is <coughs> There is a figure here where you can get an example. A trial and error procedure is one route for optimizing model performance. It's, it's not the only one. Trial and value, uh, trial and error, sorry. Trial and error is, uh, takes time. There is one very positive of, um, implication of a trial and error procedure. And the positive implication is that while running the model several times, you learn how the model works. And uh, which is, uh, in order to increase your expert knowledge, it's important. Remember, we are talking now optimization of model performances. But you see that expert knowledge comes into play. And in particular, if you are more expert, probably you converge more rapidly to the optimal parameter. What do I mean for learning how a model works? Keep in mind that it's extremely important when you apply model to keep in mind that you are an engineer. I think I already mentioned this to you. So you don't have to apply models blindly. You always have to apply models with your technical purpose in mind. Your technical purpose should be very clear. And your technical purpose is related to an actual design, to an actual process that you, have, you are trying to emulate. Which means that you should, you should always be able to identify when the model is providing a satisfactory response or if there are problems. In this particular case, it's very easy because you have an hypergraph that you compare with your model simulation. Sometimes it's not so easy to understand if a model provides a good response. And therefore, it is extremely important that you try to understand the process that you are reproducing and try to understand how the model works and try, at the end of the story, <coughs> to assess whether the two things, model and reality, are comparable. So, in running the model with uh, manually, because this is a manual operation that you perform, one by one, you run the model and you understand how it works. Uh, I want to give you an example of what understanding means. Uh, it's not uh, uh, a chance, the fact it's not by chance that I made these three dashed lines uh, in order to represent two wrong model parameters and one correct. Actually, I made these examples because I want to take the opportunity to explain to you with the linear reservoir what happens if your k value is too low or too high. Remember that the k value gives uh, this kind of relationship, uh, is related, is inserted into this kind of relationship. What does it mean according to this kind of relationships if I increase k? If I increase k, I lower with the same storage the value of q, which means that basically I am increasing the storage into the catchment. So a longer value, a higher value of k, gives the implication that I need a higher and higher storage if I want to give in the river the same flow, which means that I am augmenting, increasing catchment storage. And this is the kind of physical relationship that you have to keep in mind. What does it mean 
if I increase K, besides increasing storage, it takes more time for the catchment to respond. Why it takes more time? Because the catchment needs to store water before responding to rainfall. And therefore, the response of the catchment, I mean in terms of flow into the river, is delayed. The catchment needs to store water, and then once it has stored water, but to store water it needs rainfall, once that the storage is increased, the catchment responds in terms of river flow, which means longer time, which means that the hydrograph, it's, it's uh, delayed in time, and uh, what is called the base time of the hydrograph, which is basically the time that takes the hydrograph to raise and uh, decrease, the base time is increased. The hydrograph becomes longer in time. So this first option that I depicted here means that k is too high. Because the simulated dash line, this one, the one with the longer base time, the simulated hydrograph is longer in time with respect to the observed one, which means that I put a k value too high. So I decided to run again the model with a lower k value, but it was reduced too much. So <coughs> look, this hydrograph has a base time that is shorter with respect to the observed one, which means that I have to go with a k value in between. <coughs> there is another thing that I wanted to, it's important that you try to understand from here, just in order to give you an example. You may see that the longer the base time of the hydrograph and the lower the peak flow that I depicted here. So with the long base time, I put a peak flow that is lower than the observed. With the shorter base time, I put a, a peak flow which is higher. And you, you may wonder, why is that? If you run the model, you understand that indeed it works like that. But what is the reason? The reason is that uh, you may remember that in the linear reservoir, there is another equation, which is the mass balance equation. Mass balance equation means that uh, the volume of water given by the hydrograph should be conserved. Uh, the model conserves it. It imposes it. In an hydrograph, how do I see the volume of water that is conveyed by that hydrograph? It's the area of the hydrograph. So basically, I depict another one in order to keep the figure clean. If I have this hydrograph here, the volume of water is given by the area. Because remember that the the fl river flow is volume per time. If I take the area of the hydrograph, meaning that I integrate Q over time, I get the volume. So if the area of the simulated hydrograph is conserved by the model, necessarily, if I take a shorter in, in time, a shorter hydrograph, I push the peak up because otherwise the area is not conserved. I need to stretch the peak towards the high flows. Conversely, if I stretch the hydrograph in time, of course, the peak goes down because the area must remain the same. And this is the kind of expert knowledge that you have to gain. In this case, it's very simple, but I think it is a very good example. You understand that for the case uh, making uh, for the case of I mode, which is the second model that you know, making a, a similar reasoning is extremely complicated because I have five parameters to estimate, <coughs> and for each of them I should try to understand what happens if I decrease or increase the value of that parameter, which is a good exercise because I think that you have uh, the capability if you look at the structure of the model and you, if you make some attempts, eh, tomorrow we will try to, uh, to, to apply IMOD in, uh, with a practical exercise. So you will have the opportunity also to play with the DC and with the parameter values. So you have the opportunity indeed for five times five parameters to 
try to understand how the model works. But it is more complicated. Why is that? Because there is interaction between parameters. So if you study, for instance, what happens if you increase Cmax, what happens depends on the value of the other parameters. So if you increase Cmax with an alpha value that is beta, beta k value, that is closer to 1, the effect is different with respect to increasing Cmax with a beta k value that is close to 0. And this is what makes understanding how the model works, this is what makes gaining expert knowledge difficult, because you should make some combinations, like, okay, Cmax, if it increases, the ideograph changes in this way, but what if I try to change beta k and then I increase Cmax? You have to make many trials, and with five parameters, it's difficult to manage. You understand that the number of trials that you have to make, it's, it's, it's uh, high. And uh, keep in mind that there are models that count like 50 parameters. It becomes almost impossible. If, if your model becomes complex and complex, uh, it becomes almost impossible. But still, still, there is room uh, for increasing your expert knowledge by looking at model equations and uh, by making some trials. And if you are motivated in doing that, your capability to apply a model becomes uh, uh, higher and higher. This is something that I also notice in the research community. I see that there are some people that are very good uh, in, in making models, but they don't have a very good perception of what it means running a model. And uh, I think that from a practical and technical point of view, this is a, limit, a limitation. And uh, this is why I say trial and error, it's uh, maybe, I mean, something that is useful. But as I said, it becomes complicated. If you try to imagine what it can be calibrating guidebook by trial and error, it's a bit complicated because you have five parameters to vary and, uh, you know. But still, trial and error, it's the first procedure that has been devised for calibrating model parameters. And there is a precise reason why it was the first that was introduced. Besides trying to understand how the model works, there was a reason. The reason was that up to, up to 19, uh, end of the 1970s, people had to run the model manually. Like they took a sheet of paper and uh, they ran it manually. The linear reservoir, people were used to do that. So they took, as I said, a sheet of paper and then they started making computations. Uh, with the uh, finite differences approach or numerical integration, uh, I'm sorry, or analytical integration, which was easier because uh, if you have to, you understand, if you have to apply a finite differences approach on a sheet of paper, probably you would better prefer to make an analytical integration because it's shorter. With the Introduction of the PCs, uh, it became trial and error, easier and easier, faster and faster. And therefore, people realized that they could, uh, on the one hand, introduce more complex models because uh, trial and error became faster and faster. On the other hand, uh, people started to think about an automatic way of uh, carrying out trial and error. It would be indeed. Uh, it would have been indeed a good progress if uh, they could leave the PC making uh, the trial and error procedures by itself. Uh, and uh, this is what they did. The beginning of the 90s, with the widespread diffusion of the PCs, uh, there were an intensive research activity in uh, computational science and uh, ICT, informatics, uh, computer technology, there were an intensive activity in devising automatic procedures for model calibration. And this is uh, the second uh, avenue to apply optimization of model performances that I want to mention to you. 
which is the most widely applied today because, as I said, it's automatic and, uh, as I said, the calibrating a model with five parameters, I know, by trial and error, it's uh, difficult, if not impossible, in some cases. What is essential? What is an essential requirement in order to carry out an automatic procedure? Think about uh, how trial and error works. Uh, you run the model, you look at the simulation, and you say, OK, I am happy with it. At a certain point, you say, OK, I am happy. We need to make the PC able to make this judgment. So we have to substitute our visual judgment with an automatic judgment by the PC. Of course, the PC cannot say, well, I'm happy. The PC, we need to give a criteria. And so determining this criteria became an intensive activity of research, which is still active. And the way people decided to move forward was through the introduction of objective functions. So basically, we need, in order to make the computer able to decide, we need to introduce a numeric criteria in order to say, OK, I am happy, which is reductive. If you think at the purpose of designing, at the purpose of engineering, it's much better to look at the hydrograph and say, I am happy, with respect to introducing a numerical criteria. Because a numerical criteria is objective, but being objective probably doesn't reflect, it doesn't completely mirror our judgment. Because when we look at an hydrograph, we don't look at a numerical criteria. We look at a series of things. Like we could say, well, the big flow here is not very, very well reproduced, but the low flow it is. I am more interested in the low flow with respect to the big flow, so I am happy, even if the big flow is not really well reproduced. It's not easy to translate in a numerical criteria this kind of reasoning, but this is what people try to do. And of course, they have to introduce this numerical criteria, which is called objective function. And you can understand why it's called objective function, because uh, it reflects our objective, uh, which is making the model the best possible. OK, so people started to think, uh, what could be a criteria? And this was intensive research. At the beginning, they found, of course, uh, their primary, sorry if I, I, I forgot to make this premise, this, their primary concern was to avoid mistakes. To avoid that a criteria could give a positive response when the simulation was very bad. And this is possible. If I if I asked you, this would be an interesting exercise, before doing this lecture, okay, for tomorrow, try to propose to me what is a good criteria, and you didn't have any preliminary knowledge, because probably you have already had some other courses <coughs> that mentioned to you this problem, but you wouldn't have any preliminary knowledge, and you wouldn't try the PC before then proposing, I'm sure that you probably would get some criteria that may lead to completely wrong simulations and it would be interesting to try at the PC what happens with criteria that you may individually devise. It's very easy to make mistakes. But let me jump to what was uh, and what still is uh, one of the most popular criteria for optimizing model performances uh, and uh, which is least squares. Uh, so let's suppose that uh, we have our observed variable, which is uh, called QT. It's an hydrograph, OK? This is our observed variable. And let's call the simulated counterpart Q hat T. So this is OPS, and this is SIM. And let's suppose that uh, our observed data Observed sample, sample means group, in this case of observations. Let's suppose that our observed time series 
These are more or less synonyms. Observed data, observed sample, observed time series, they are more or less synonyms. I say more or less because data, sample are more general. Time series means data observed a long time, like an hydrograph is. Try to get acquainted with these terms. So let's suppose that our observed sample counts capital N observations. OK, the least squares. Let me see what kind of uh, symbol I used here. So it's very tiny. Sometimes uh, this is a problem that I still have to resolve. When I include uh, <coughs> images for formulas in the HTML and I change the resolution of the screen, they don't appear well. But anyway, I hope that you don't have this problem on your PC when you study at home. If yes, if you have such kind of problems that you cannot read something, just let me know because I, I have some still some trials that they could make to resolve it. F Theta, it's my objective function, where theta is the vector of the model parameters. I say vector because the parameters may be more than one. So f theta, my objective function, is equal to the summation for t equal 1 to n, or let me say i equal 1 to n, which is more generic of, uh, I use i here of t, let me see. Uh, 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 uh. I use t here, it doesn't change much, but anyway. And uh, it's uh, qt, qi. Okay, let me make them consistent, t. Okay, t equal 1 to n, which means that it's a time series, it doesn't matter. Doesn't match up too much which kind of index you use. Qt minus Q at t squared. This is the first objective function that was introduced, which is still very widely used. <coughs> so basically, you take the difference between any observation, each observation and its uh,